Hello and welcome uh, for welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be uh, talking about the second half or second third, the the last third of <laughs> the Birth of Tragedy uh, by Frederick Nietzsche. And uh, I think I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because uh, a lot of the same ideas we talked about last week are still prevalent here. Um, and this is a very dense work, obviously. And uh, my caveat last time was I'm not. I'm not going to give it the same kind of attention of a of a you know a real scholar. You know, this is my first time reading it, and I'm not really uh, a Nietzsche scholar. Um, but I'm going to try and do my best and try and offer some good insights here. Um, so I would say that the main thrust of the argument in um, what we read, the uh, final part of the book, um, he's extending this argument about uh, the Socratic um, idea and how. Uh, Socrates led this revolution in logic and reason, and that was the death of tragedy, right? We removed this Dionysian aspect, we focused entirely on the Apollonian, and uh, he talks about this new society that was created, the Alexandrian. So this Alexandrian society that is totally uh, dedicated to reason, logic, and moving away from anything, uh, anything Dionysian, anything... Uh, primal, anything spiritual, anything of that nature. Um, and uh, from here, you know, our culture is obviously degraded. Uh, there's no more tragedy. There's not much good left here. So obviously this is a problem for Nisha. And so his solution is we need to have a rebirth of tragedy, right? Bring back the Greek tragedy and bring back uh, the purity of music, and that is going to have this cultural awakening. And <clears throat> so my initial thoughts on this, uh, once again, he's so, so close and then misses the mark entirely. Uh, obviously, there is a problem with this Alexandrian society and this focus on uh, only pure reason. Uh, but the solution is not going to be a, a resurgence of art. Okay, the, we have plenty of art right now. And most of it sucks. And I'm sure, well, and that's another thing I'll get into. Why did, does the art suck? And Nishu, Nisha would say, uh, well, the art isn't, you know, true art. It's not uh, channeling this Dionysian energy. It's not uh, channeling myth. Um, but, you know, these are just things that, you know, when, if you do see art and you just say that's not real art and use that to prove the fact that, you know, uh, just having art isn't going to reawaken your society. Uh, that's just, you know, it, it's a coping argument. He uh, just rationalizes away anything that uh, goes against his opinion. Uh, case in point, he talked about opera, right? Now, me, as a, as a non-student of opera, I look at opera and it seems extremely uh, similar to Greek tragedy. You know, you have this focus on music, uh, and uh, you're telling a mythological story, um, and uh, obviously that ties in very closely with Greek tragedy, um, but he says that this is not a true representation of tragedy, it's not a true rebirth of tragedy, and part of it is because he says it focuses too much on the message and not enough on uh, the music. And as we talked about last week, music is the purest form of art, because it is not an imitation, right? So if you just tell a story, you are imitating reality. If you paint a picture, you're imitating reality. Art uh, is always an imitation of reality except for music. So music, uh, it's an actual channeling of the will rather than a representation of the will. Um, so that makes music this most pure form of art. So he says that opera is actually not focusing on the music. Now, I would actually say I think it focuses more on music because, um, you know, personally, there's people that go to operas that are in different language. They don't even understand what's being said, which means they're specifically there for the music and not entirely there for the story. Um, so once again, I think he's just taking a, an example that uh, goes against what he's saying and finds a way to rationalize away from it. He's like, well, that wasn't actually a rebirth of tragedy. Well, I think opera kind of is a rebirth of tragedy. Not to mention he has this um, basic worship of uh, 
Richard Wagner, who is obviously a, a prolific opera writer. Um, so obviously he thinks that there's something to opera, and opera is probably, I mean, I look at Lohengrin, I mean, this is probably one of the greatest pieces of music developed by Western culture. What more are we going to get? <laughs> you know, what what kind of a rebirth are we going to see that is going to produce something greater than Lohengrin? And I guarantee it's not going to happen in 2021, that's for sure. Um, so once again, I, I think he has something in front of him that is uh, a clear counterexample to what he's saying, and then just finds a way to rationalize it away. Once again, missing the point of everything. So I think if he just, you know, rather than trying to rationalize away spirituality and religion in this form of Dionysian art, if he just would admit to himself that yes, there is something to this uh, whole religion and spirituality thing and having a belief in the immaterial, something beyond yourself that isn't perfectly rational, because he, he articulates a lot of these things, you know, the difference between uh, myth and irrational faith versus, you know, this faith entirely based on uh, logic, and we'll get into that. Uh, once again, he articulates this very well, but he's not, uh, he's not going all the way with it. It seems like he's almost shying away from admitting that there's something more to religion than just some primal unity, some uh, intoxicating aspect that he thinks is just manifested in art. So that's my, my final take, I think, on the birth of tragedy. I'm going to go into some uh, cool quotes that I liked, but I guess, uh, yeah, all in all, he gets very close, but ultimately misses the mark as far as, uh, you know, what actually is the problem and the solution. The solution is not uh, a rebirth of tragedy. I would say it's a rebirth of spirituality and true spirituality, you know, a, a traditionalist type of spirituality. Um, just art alone is not going to do it for us. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, like I said, this is a viewing things from a, a right reactionary perspective, and I think that's how, you know, it has to be. And, you know, he's good at articulating the problem, but I think we offer a much better solution. So, uh, going through some of these quotes that I found pretty interesting. So I think this was in chapter 16. He says, uh, The intimate relationship between music and the true essence of all things can also explain how when appropriate music accompanies any scene, action, event, or surroundings, it seems to reveal to us its most secret meaning and emerges as the most accurate and clearest commentary upon it. That was a really interesting insight. Um, and I think it actually lends itself to his point that music is the purest form of art. And this actually got me thinking about, you know, how music does really, uh, it, it creates more impact. I mean, you watch a movie, if it has a great score, the movie is better, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's the most um, plain example. But, you know, th that is something to think about. Why exactly is that? And uh, music, you know, it is a pretty complex thing. You know, uh, us as animals, you know, that we can recognize these patterns in just vibrations. It's uh, pretty impressive. You know, I think there is something primal to this and something that is resonating at a very deep level with us when it comes to music. Not that I think music is the solution to everything, like Nisha suggests, but I do think there is a power to music that uh, I think he actually does articulate here, and he does make a good point. <laughs> Um, so that was chapter 16. So finding my next note. Uh, so if we turn our gaze to the ramp rampant development of the representation of character and of psychological refinement in tragedy from Sophocles on, uh, that's not a complete sentence, but I just highlighted that part because he, he talks about, uh, Sophocles talking about, uh, Sophocles' manifesting play is a representation of character, and this is different from uh, pre-Sophocles' tragedy that was more universal and the not so much character-based, I would almost say situational-based or prophecy-based. And this is something that 
Spangler talks about, actually, which is really interesting that he's bringing it up because they're using it in very different ways. So he's saying that uh, Nisha is saying that anything post-Sophocles is character tragedy, whereas Spangler said that Greek tragedy, tragedy was all situational tragedy, so as in not character-based, whereas Western tragedy is entirely character-based. You know, you look at uh, Hamlet, it's not so much about the situation, but rather the character of Hamlet, right? Whereas you look at Oedipus, it's not so much about the character of Oedipus, but the situation Oedipus is in because of fate. So you have these two different uh, types in contrast with each other, the classic and the Western. But here, Nisha is actually saying that the Western began uh, with Sophocles, which is interesting. I don't know how much I agree or disagree. I mean, perhaps it's a, it's a spectrum of character tragedy versus situational tragedy. And Sophocles just leans harder on the spectrum, but not as much as Shakespeare does. Um, but yeah, I think this is just interesting because uh, maybe I'm missing something, but this seems like a point of contention between uh, Spangler and Nisha when uh, I believe Spangler made it sound like Nisha was his main influence. <clears throat> uh, so next part, this is a good one. In the face of such threatening storms, who dares to call calmly on our pale and exhausted religions, whose very foundations have even degenerated into religions for scholars? This is to such an extent that myth, the necessary presupposition of every religion, is already everywhere paralyzed, and even this religious domain has succumbed to the domination of that optimistic spirit, which we have, char we have, which we have just characterized as the seed of our society's annihilation. Uh, so that's a really great quote. And I, I see his, uh, some of his critiques of religion articulated very well here. You have uh, religion, specifically Christianity, that has become, like he says, a religion of scholars. You have this uh, very logical perception of religion, especially in the Protestants, uh, you know, the German Protestants of his time. And they are sort of taking the myth out of religion, which is... A, a massive failure because without the myth there really is no basis for the religion i mean you can you can use logic all you want but ultimately you need to have some pillar of faith um, and where that faith starts is uh you know that's that's for the individual and when you subtract out that aspect it's a uh, it is very empty and you do end up with these you know degenerated protestant religions um, and then the final form of that is what you see today where, you know, you have Christians that are basically not Christian. They just <laughs> say they're Christian and, uh, you know, maybe they go to church and they pray, but they don't believe in anything Christian. You know, they believe in uh, gay rights, premarital sex, uh, all of these things. And what exactly are they doing? Well, it's because they're able to rationalize these positions because they are totally uh, devoid of any true myth. They are not responding to anything deeper or more spiritual. This is just, it's like a, it's a mask for them. They can just wear this mask of Christianity and act perfectly rational without understanding any of the, the mystery of faith. Uh, which is, once again, something that he's articulating very, very well. Uh, which is why, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why he can say this and then say that the solution is somehow going to be music rather than a return to the the myth right you need to develop this spirituality this faith based in uh some appeal to the immaterial and this is what he's not good at articulating but he is good at articulating the problems right good with problems not good with solutions the story of nisha <clears throat> uh and i got a few more here for you so uh, moreover, he feels how a culture which is constructed on the principle of science must meet its end when it begins to become illogical, that is, to flee from its own consequences. Another absolutely great quote, which really captures some of the essence of modernity. Um, and what does it mean to become illogical and have to deal with your own consequences? Well, I see the fact that rational existence has not led to an increase in quality of life. 
and your your truest rationalists just avoid this they run from this hard truth you know you present people statistics you say well actually you know people are more depressed than ever uh you know we have so more people on antidepressants we have higher suicide rate shouldn't uh you know with this uh, modern modern advancement shouldn't life be better shouldn't we be happier people if this is actually the right path and nobody really addresses this they just kind of you know try to either hand wave it away or really rationalize it and once again you have a logical society that is now defying logic you know you're presenting a problem to them and they cannot come up with a logical solution it ends up just being you know rationality spiraling that does not accomplish anything and you're just headed on a fast track to destruction right i mean what's going to happen if we just continue to become more and more depressed but don't pull back on any of our you know technological advancement this is an illogical uh decision <laughs> you know we've we've put logic on such a pedestal that now it becomes illogical when we have to face the consequences so yeah i think you know that's one passage once again articulates a problem very very well uh so good on him there <clears throat> so there's that one and we got two more so while the critic had come to dominate the theater and concert as the journalist had come to dominate the school and the press had come to dominate society art degenerated into an entertainment object of the lowest kind so this is a good quote because uh, we look at how uh, he says the critic right has come to dominate entertainment um, but I, I see this in a kind of uh, broader sense you know not just the, the critic but the mass man you need to have mass media that can appeal to a lowest common denominator because it becomes ultimately entertainment right it is no longer and, and this is one thing I might I, I would say about uh, tragedy you have great tragedy that is this spiritual thing it's kind of aiming towards a higher truth and a higher myth um, which is different from you know most media today that's for sure with that said I would say opera seems to capture that same essence at least um, aesthetically you know I see this it, it's very uh, it's reaching higher right it's attempting to be very grand and uh, lofty in its ideals um i've never actually been to an opera so, so maybe i'm maybe i'm mistaken here but i see opera as really capturing the greek tragedy in the way that he says it does not uh but you know and this is this is something we've talked about uh when we read amusing ourselves to death right as you have a, a media that has to appeal to a wider and wider market it is going to degenerate and degrade and uh you're going to move away from creating media that has any type of meaning and this has happened with music it's happened with uh drama um and like i said he's very good at articulating this he he names the problem and uh it's something that has only continued to get worse you know he's living in a time before television imagine if he were to watch uh you know the 700 club what would he think of that and so one last quote, this one was really, I don't know, this one really made me think. Uh, so this is from the last, very last page of the book. And he's talking about, uh, you know, returning to this Greek tragic ideal. And he says, but that this effect is necessary should be sensed intuitively and most surely by everyone who has once, even in dream, felt himself transported back into an ancient Hellenic existence strolling beneath lofty Ionian colonnades, gazing up towards a horizon defined by pure and noble lines, accompanied by reflections of his transfigured form in the shining marble at his side, surrounded by men who move with solemn stride or delicate gait, speaking a language of harmonious sounds and rhythmic gestures. So this is very poetic and really, uh, really creates a picture for you. But ultimately, I, I mean, it, it fell so flat and seemed meaningless. Why? Because this really sinks in the fact that Nisha has never lived in ancient Greece, and none of us have. So this whole idea 
this this image that he's creating of Greek tragedy is just based on his his internal conception of it. You know, he never actually watched Oedipus be performed. He never watched, uh, you know, Sophocles do a play. He doesn't know, like, whether Sophocles didn't capture the essence of Aeschylus. You know, maybe they were more similar than he lets on. I mean, he's just looking at the text and making these assumptions when he's never actually seen the play performed. In the same way, you know, when he talks about opera, and says that opera cannot match Greek tragedy. Well, you've never seen a Greek tragedy. You don't know how it compares to an opera. Maybe an opera is exactly the same as what a Greek tragedy feels like. So, yeah, I think he, he forms these opinions and then rationalizes backwards for these opinions. You know, And he has this very high opinion of tragedy and music, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean anything if it's only true because he says it's true. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just, it's some interesting ideas in here, but it's not exactly groundbreaking and earth-shattering as far as, you know, trying to shape a, a sort of worldview. Um, so, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the birth of tragedy. Uh, and one other point on this, he talks about um, tragedy being like, the pure, purest embodiment of myth, which I think is also just conjecture. It doesn't, like, you can say that, but you don't really have anything to back that up, you know? You think that uh, tragedy is more pure form of myth than the Iliad or the Odyssey? You know, you've had oral tradition um, of these myths, these epic myths, for thousands of years, and you're going to say that all of that is inferior to tragedy. Um, I just don't, I don't really buy it. And then you can say the incorporation of music. Well, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey were, they were poetry, right? They were somewhat musical in tone. I mean, it's really only a small step up from the Iliad to tragedy. So, yeah, I just don't, uh, I don't buy a lot of his explanations here. With that said, I will give him credit for articulating problems very well, but not articulating solutions and making claims that are entirely his opinion without much to back them up. So that is The Birth of Tragedy by Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, I, hope you, uh, I hope you learned some things from that. So I'll open up the phone lines. doesn't look like we have that many viewers, so... I doubt it will, uh, I doubt anybody's going to stop by, but, uh, I'll hang out in case anybody wants to talk. Otherwise, in the meantime, I'm going to plug everything, you know, uh, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on, uh, Odyssey. I started a Telegram. The Telegram's nice. There's this new, like, Clubhouse chat feature. We could start doing, uh, these discussions in there. I was using that earlier today, and it, uh, it is really nice. It's a really nice feature, really easy to talk. Um, I don't know if it's encrypted or anything, if that's, you know, uh, important to you, but, I mean, I think it works just as well, if not better than uh, Discord chat. <clears throat> so if everybody ends up moving to Telegram, we would actually be able to do that. Right now, I only have, like, five people there, so uh, I don't think it would be very uh, important to start doing telegram discussions. I don't think anybody would uh, show up to that. So I don't know how far behind the stream is, but uh, I don't really foresee anybody coming in. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for watching. I think I'm going to uh, cut the stream. Um, so, thanks. Bye.